Hello viewers, you join me at a location not far away from my house. I'm here in a field and I'm delighted to be able to do a rare in-person interview with someone who is visiting Croatia and who happens to be a former Bethelite, William Morgan. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Lloyd. So I don't get to speak to that many ex-Bethelites, certainly in person. And I'm especially pleased that you visited because when you reached out and connected with me, it became obvious that you knew a lot or were heavily involved in one of the very first stories I covered as an activist. Is that right? That's right. I remember you telling me that. That's, that's really neat to have that kind of connection to it. Exactly. And we'll get more into that as our conversation <laughs> follows. But this is to do with your insider knowledge of, I'm just going to put it bluntly, the organization burying toxic waste. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> there we go, the spoilers out of the bag. Uh, but we'll get to that. First of all, could you just explain to the viewers a little bit about your background and how you first came to be involved with Jehovah's Witnesses? Sure. Um, my parents began studying with uh, friends of theirs who were having a Bible study. Um, this is in upstate New York. And um, my father especially took to the, the study and, and decided he wanted him and his family to be Jehovah's Witnesses. I was 13 at the time. Um, I have an older and a younger sister. And it really didn't take with me. You know, at that age, I had, um, you know, I, I enjoyed sports. I had a lot of friends. Uh, had girlfriends, you know, doing normal things that I... Not just a girlfriend, but girlfriends. <laughs> well, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Over the course of my high school okay. experience. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, so, it, you know, it never really stuck mm. with me. Uh, me and my father had a tenuous, uh, tenuous relationship at that time as well. So this created additional tension. Mm. And... Um, so, you know, uh, after high school, I, you know, I was out of the house doing my own thing, pursuing my own career. But somewhere in my, it was, I think it was around 22 or 23, I decided to take up the uh, subject of religion for myself. And I had, you know, just from going to the meetings and learning, having Bible studies and like that, you, you are equipped with at least that version of, of a knowledge of the Bible. So, um, and as soon as I started doing that, immediately the, the sort of the, the distance that was between myself and my parents uh, just kind of vanished. So it, it was very appealing to continue to follow that, that course. And so I did, and um, I ended up getting baptized and uh, I was very, uh, very much into it and pursuing it and wanting to be the, the best I could be. Um, shortly after being baptized, I think it was less than two years, I got invited to go to Bethel. And so... Uh, what year would this have been? It was quite some time ago. So I think it was 1995. Okay. So uh, the mid-90s. And... Um, so I started there at Bethel. I started in the building repairs department, which was, it was a really fun little department. We were like handymen. <laughs> and uh, we, we got to travel to all parts of the facility and, and do little, uh, little tasks. And, and I was in that department for just a few months. And then after that, I, I got uh, asked to um, work at the water treatment facility. Now, prior to this, I had a background in nuclear power uh, with some hazardous waste and remediation projects kind of in my background. So how, when you say in your background, so did you work for companies that dealt with that? Yes. When I was uh, starting at 18, I, I worked in, in, for a nuclear power facility. And in that industry, it's very easy to get temporary contract work. And uh, being young and adventurous, I didn't mind traveling from facility to facility and, and picking up work, it paid well and it gave me a lot of free time in between work. So um, 
I had, I had done that for quite a few years, well, uh, about four or five years. And before I decided to quit that, um, I think I auxiliary pioneered for a little while and then, uh, you know, was asked to go to Bethel. Okay. So. so you had this background in waste management and, and that sort of thing, and, and okay. that came, became relevant yes. in your Bethel work. I believe so. Mm. I mean, I don't know what, what factors caused them to choose me, but obviously I had some level of sophistication in an industrial sort of setting, and it made the most sense that, that it, you know, the mm. water and wastewater treatment plants would be a good place for me to start. So, okay. And that's how I ended up there. Okay. Yeah, if you have kind of an unskilled, untrained workforce, and you have someone who knows something <laughs> about how to deal with waste and that kind of yeah. thing. They're, they're going to be the obvious candidate. Right. So, and, and, and how did you first come to learn that there was a problem with the disposal of, of waste at Watchtower? Well, uh, part of my duties in that department, it was the regulatory services department. Um, we also had uh, kind of a regulatory oversight on some of the construction, particularly when it came to putting in the underground utilities. There's a lot of uh, codes and, and regulations you have to make sure you're complying with. Um, also some of the site uh, erosion control measures, things like that um, would fall under our, our purview and our responsibility. So um, we, we had those sort of duties. We were the ones to call mm -hmm. if any sort of issue like that came up. And it was a fairly small department, maybe um, 10 or 12 of us. Okay. And um, yeah, that, that, that fell into our laps. Okay. And so w when did you first come to learn? Because as, as I understand it, and I reported on this in 2011, it was actually one of my first ever articles for JW Survey. Mm -hmm. And there were two media articles that came to my attention, which I linked in my article, I've actually got them printed out oh, here yes. uh -huh. because the links no longer work, mysteriously. <laughs> <laughs> mysteriously, you can no longer get any kind of corroborative information about this. Right. Um, but if you go on the Wayback Machine, mm -hmm. you can print out the articles, which is what I've done. So this all came to light, as I understand it, around 2007. But from what we were, you were saying earlier, you'd already left by this point, so. Uh, it, so for some background, what came to light in 2007 was that I filled out a whistleblower's report with the New York Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC. Right. And, um, you know, I had left Bethel at that time, um, but this issue just, just kind of weighed on me. You know, I had a lot of other things going on in my life leaving Bethel, unwinding from the truth, kind of unraveling that, that, that sort of, you know, the, the effects it has on you and starting your, your life over without that. Um, but it always, it always uh, weighed on me that there was this legacy issue that didn't get dealt with appropriately. And uh, that is what happened in 2007. I filled out a, um, a, a, an online form. So 2007, your conscience catches up with you yeah. <laughs> and, and you feel the need to revisit this thing that happened. So right. I'm just trying to establish a timeline. You joined Bethel in 1995. Right. And at what year did it come to your attention that so there was this problem? In 1997, they were building uh, what's called the C residence. We had the, the B residence was already built. And as an extension of that, there was the C residence. It was just residence buildings. And during the course of that construction, um, there was uh, heavy machinery doing excavating for you know foundation work and underground utilities. And, and one day we get a call uh, to come out and look at something. And, and so what had happened is the excavators uh, pulled out some barrels. And uh, the first few, you know, they weren't expecting anything. So the first few kind of uh, opened up the contents of these barrels and you had this blue sort of oily oozing stuff that came out of them. So it wasn't something 
that they knew what to do with or you know they obviously everything stopped and and what have what do we have here yeah and that's kind of how this issue came to light um so did some other excavating found some other barrels in the immediate vicinity and you know we removed them brought them to another location and and there was kind of a kind of a, a timeout that happened why while they figured out well what is it what do we have here and what's the the larger issue and i remember there was a lot of hand wringing over what to do about this matter how many barrels are we talking about we found between 10 to 15 okay. in, in one little one little area and that was that you knew of that could have been more right so you know what came to light is um you know no one knew exactly uh, the history of this these specific barrels but uh, you know, apparently there were areas of Watchtower Farms where th there were either construction waste or perhaps other waste like this that were buried. It was, mm. you know, happened sometime in the past. Mm. So the concern was that, you know, it, it, if this matter was probed into further, well, you'd have, you know, it, it, would, it would open Pandora's box, so yeah. to speak. I'm so. looking at an article by... Um, Adam Bosch, yes. uh, the Times Herald Record. This is one of the articles that I linked to and has <laughs> since disappeared. Right. Um, and it's saying that the barrels contained um, benz benzene, xylene, and other chemicals that have been shown to affect human health. So this was most likely uh, printing chemicals or printing waste. Right. And, and that's what we were we were told uh, you could see some of the items in there were uh, you know uh, either filters or, or components part of printing pressed waste you know on a small scale if you have an inkjet printer you don't just have the the ink you have other cartridges so it, on, on a bigger scale you had other it waste looked like material. M materials that were connected with printing right. in some way. It's exactly okay. what it was. There was no question of what it was. Obviously, they're, they've been printing for hundreds of, or hundred, over 100 years by then. Sure. And in the, in the article, um, and I, I think as we're going to learn, you were kind of fund, you were responsible for these articles being written. That's yes, right. Um, in the article, it, it makes clear that, um, or it suggests, that the um, gi gigantic printing operation dates back to the 1970s. So is your understanding that this material would have been buried around the 1970s or later? You know, I can't say with precision, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the term that was floated around at that time was the sins of our fathers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it was believed by some that these were waste from Brooklyn from that Brooklyn, were right. shipped up to the farm. Mm. Um, you know, like I said, I can't say for sure. Mm. I don't know, but those were some of the conversations that I overheard, took part of, you know, were, were a part of. And um, so, yeah, and, and there was other indications that, that the waste was dated. Um, I learned through this issue that barrel construction it can be dated you just by how so you look at the barrel and you can tell roughly when it was right right, right. The manufacturing styles and, yeah. and standards yeah. have changed over time yeah so and that became a problem in this issue as well because uh you know if if, if a regulator were to come out uh, and see a, a barrel that looked like it was manufactured in the 40s that would spark further questions. Right. And, and that was a big concern um, in this matter, that, that further questions would be asked. Right, so they find these barrels and the main concern is, is what? Is how do we comply with the law or is it how do we make this problem go away? Well, it, it seemed that um, the, the primary concern was how it would look to the public or how, how, you know, how this would appear in the press. So um, that and I'm sure there, there could have been the cost, cost concerns, lots of concerns mm. with something like this. It, it, 
I, I got the sense that it was somewhat widespread. I mean, I, I don't know, but, it, mm. it, but they were very concerned that there were other areas. And, and my overseer actually pointed out areas where they thought that some, there might be more. Right. Yeah. So um, that was a concern. And uh, initially the response, and I detailed this in my, um, in my report to the DEC and follow up conversations with their investigation. Yeah. The initial report was a very minimized report. And, and in fact, it was, uh, in my opinion, it didn't tell the whole story. It didn't tell the whole story at all, but um, it, it was to present this as an isolated case, a very small minor mishap, and that's that. Whereas uh, it did not indicate whatsoever that there could be other legacy material out there. Mm. Um, nobody wanted that to come out. Mm. And it didn't until, um, you know, until I reported it and, and, you know, that whole investigation ran its course. But you reported it after you'd left. That's right. Yeah. So when you first discovered this issue in 1997, what, how was it dealt with at that time? So, as I mentioned, so we have, uh, we had all facilities that do any sort of um, industrial activities will have a hazardous waste permit. Mm. And that permit allows for a certain amount of anticipated waste mm. to be generated on a, a regular basis. And it's mm. tightly regulated. Mm. So, uh, but what we discovered was a volume that was much bigger. Mm. It isn't, you know, it isn't something that you could collect together and put in the, the When small. we were talking about this before, you yeah. said, here's what our permit was, That's and right. this is how much we found. Right. right. So, for example, on, on their permit, I'll use as an, an example, one 55-gallon drum of waste per month. I don't know the exact mm. amount, but it was along that, mm. that level. And here we had two large dump trucks full of um, contaminated soil. We had several drums, some of them damaged, some of them not damaged. You're not gonna, you're not gonna process that waste through the existing permit. Your existing permit, permit. Right. okay. Right, right, so. And what was the solution? Well, I was asked, uh, along with a few others, to uh, separate some of the material. So you had um, remnants of barrels, you had printing components, and then a large amount of soil. Now, the the barrels and the printing components or 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 what you know the the material that could be consolidated but the volume of soil was was something that was you know it had blue streaks in it and it was not something you could take anywhere yeah you know so it was um it was uh in, and there's a great bit of secrecy over this affair in bethel right so the trucks were driven to a warehouse and just parked there. Uh, I was assigned on a Sunday. Um, and You said it was a Sunday yeah. up, so that everyone would be out of Bethel. Right, yeah, so, right. so there's you know, 1,500 to 2,000 Bethelites. They scatter them across the congregations mm. in that area. Everybody leaves on a Sunday mm. and, and they're not back until late afternoon and usually it's a, almost like a free day for Bethlehem. So mm. <clears throat> during one of these Sundays, me and a few others were assigned to seg segregate some of this material. And um, after that, the, um, and, it, and it alludes to it in that article, the volume, the dump trucks of contaminated soil was driven out behind the sawmill on a field and just kind of spread into the soil. Yeah. <laughs> so they were dumped. So how, how was it spread though? <laughs> Did you use machinery? Yes. So, so a, a bulldozer kind of put a top layer on it and then a disc. I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a disc. If it's, it's something you pull behind a right. tractor with lots of little blades right. that tills it kind of in. And, and so, so we're can, talking agricultural machinery. That's right. Yeah. So rather than um, try to comply with, with the law, uh, and, and dispose of this waste responsibly, the solution was, let's just disperse it into the <laughs> soil around the factory. Right, right. And, you know, 
you don't need to have a, a PhD in hazardous waste to know that that's not the proper way to handle it. Right. So, um, yeah, but that, nonetheless, that's what was done with a very small select few people. And you were one of the and people that did that? I was one of that? the people that did it. Okay. And uh, I didn't, it always graded on me. That was just not right. Yeah. You know, it wasn't right. And, uh, you know, you think of why anyone would go to Bethel. And that's to, to serve in a capacity for God's one true organization because, you know, we have this righteous work to do. Mm. <clears throat> and to kind of be roped into something like that just so, you know, it, it, it would, they wouldn't look bad mm. to the public eye rather than doing the right thing. Just, just kind of grated on me, you know. I didn't like being put in that position. And it ultimately, that was the reason I left Bethel. When I wrote my article, I obviously, the, the point of my article or what I tried to achieve was to just bring these two reports together and explain the significance from a Jehovah's Witness point of view. Right. And obviously one of the first um, scriptures I went to was Revelation 11 verse 18, which I think I'm <laughs> quoting now from the previous edition of the New World Translation. But this is what it says in the article. But the nations became wrathful and your own wrath came and the appointed time for the dead to be judged and to give their reward to your slaves, the prophets, and to the holy ones and to those fearing your name, the small and the great, and to bring to ruin those ruining the earth. Mm -hmm. And that was the verse that we would always use as Jehovah's Witnesses to say, you know, this proves that we're living in the last days because only now do we have the capacity to ruin the earth yeah. and those who are ruining the earth by being irresponsible towards the environment will be destroyed right. and here you're telling me that you're instructed as a Bethelite to spread toxic contaminants into the soil in what I believe was a watershed area. That's right, the Hudson Valley watershed. It's a very protected yeah. uh, watershed. Yeah. yeah, so that this could potentially find its way into watercourses and ultimately mm -hmm. river water, you know. That's right, and if you look at the remediation plan, uh, that, that the remediation effort that was conducted, that was a primary concern of, of the DEC as well. Mm. Mm. So, and it's funny you mentioned that scripture in Revelation because that scripture was discussed quite a bit in connection with this matter, but not to compel us to do to do the right, the right thing, thing yeah. but more along the lines of this is what we tell other people yeah and yet there's this legacy issue we have here we can't uh, you know this, we can't this, be found out we, right so right and you told me off camera about um someone and we do we don't need to name him um showing a, a magazine that's right <clears throat> and um, there is, an, I believe it was an Awake article around that time, mm. uh, in the mid-90s, that, that had, uh, if I recall correctly, it had a, a young girl on a trash heap, and, and, it, and it talked about how, you know, basically in the new system that um, this type of pollution would no longer be, mm. and uh, how hypocritical it was to have this magazine being published, and yet to have it brought to light mm. that there's this legacy waste I issue at the farm. That was what was concerning people the most, the, the people that were in control. So you, you participated in, um, in spreading this, this stuff and, and kind of trying to make the matter go away in mm -hmm. a very, um, frankly, illegal manner. Right. And, and then you, you leave Bethel because of this, you're saying. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so then, so this, I think, you, did you say you, you left Bethel in 2000? I believe it was 2000, the year 2000, yes. And then in 2007, that was when you, tell, tell us what happened in 2007. So you, you come to this realization that what happened when you were in Bethel was wrong mm -hmm. and you need to do something about it. So what right. did you do? Well, it, it, really the, the greater context is as I learned more as a Bethelite, and uh, just doing my own research, questions started to 
emerge question difficult questions that um, cause me to sort of question you know is this is this real and I, I remember asking myself is this what an organization that is guided by Holy Spirit from God would do mm. or does this more fit the pattern of a man-made organization and I continue to find evidence uh, that, that led me, obviously, that this is a man-made organization. So some of these things started to, to weigh on me. And then, of course, the, the, the issue with the waste came up. And so I left Bethel. And then, and then it just kind of, the more I learned, the more it was clear that, that this, this is a man-made religion. And so I left the, the religion, essentially, in those years. I, I, well, you weren't disfellowshipped, but you, no. you faded, basically. I faded, right. Yeah. And I didn't purpose, well, you know, I moved a lot in my mm. work. As I mentioned to you, I, I would travel mm. in nuclear power uh, from, from one job to another. So I, I honestly couldn't tell you where my publisher record is to mm. this day. Mm. <laughs> and that's very convenient, by the way, for mm. anyone who wants to fade. <laughs> Moving yeah. is very helpful. Um, and so I just, you know, I just walked away. But you... You, you had this kind of skeleton in the closet and you wanted to mm -hmm. address it. So what was your process for kind of correcting that? You know? Well, you know, I remember thinking to myself, you know, they're willing to not just, just make this uh, moral issue for me, but also, you know, my career in, in nuclear power. Nuclear power is highly regulated and it comes with a security clearance. That mm. can be difficult to, to get. If I was involved in any sort of questionable matter like this, it, it could, you know, it could mm. cast a shadow on my ability to continue and to work in that field. Right, yeah. exactly. So yeah. uh, that's, that's what continued to weigh on me. Uh, and then as I learned more um, about uh, this, the Watchtower Society, their history, um, I, I felt like I felt like I was kind of almost like I was tricked, you know, mm. like there, there's this whole body of information that they do not want you to read. Most mm. it's all, you know, old watchtowers or, old, you know, older material that they just they want to distance themselves from. And as I came to learn the entire truth uh, of the Watchtower Society, it just I, I was ready to just just can be completely done with it and and this issue that was sort of grating on me it was time it was time to resolve this matter too so that's when i uh looked up how to file a whistleblower claim with the new york department of dec and that's what started that what ball does going. the dec stand for sorry it's the department of environmental conservation okay it's it's the new york state's um regulatory body for environmental matters Right. So they'll control licenses, they'll control cleanup issues, things like that. So it's a phone call or is it an email or a letter? It, it was, a, I believe it was, a, it was an online form. form. Yeah. And so what happened then? So that, that began a, a back and forth with uh, DEC investigators. Yeah. And, um, you know, and they mentioned, you know, this, this is quite a few years since it happened. And, but then they were able to bring up... Um, the initial sort of diluted, uh, downplayed spill report from 1997. They asked me to, does this sound like what happened? And, and then I, I provided the, the, the bigger picture. picture. Yeah. And that started more questions. So there was something filed in 1997. There was. But it wasn't the, the true picture. That's correct. So if you could sum up what was filed in 1997, how would you characterize it? <clears throat> From my recollection, and I, I do have the report, um, they made it sound like a construction you know, machinery tipped over a barrel full of oil on clay soil. And that's very important. Oil on clay soil. Well, that's, that's going to happen in yeah. an industrial setting. But, that, but also, also, that's not remotely what happened. Not at all. <laughs> so so they, at all. they dig out this totally bogus report from 1997, and you're like, okay, here's the full picture. That's correct. And then, so now with that, armed with that information, they started asking probing questions. Right. And uh, I remember the, the one investigator reporting back to me saying, they seem to be very nervous about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, ultimately they decided it would be an administrative matter because, uh, and the investigator came out and said, well, we can't 
press criminal charges, which I didn't even know they were considering that. But apparently yeah. because of the time, you know, that kind of took that off the table and, and uh, it became an administrative matter. And it seemed like the issue sort of died away after 2007, 2008. And that was until I got contacted by the reporter. Um, right. So, okay, when you say it died away, you're saying that the DEC didn't really do anything about it. You know, correspondence kind of stopped. Right. Uh, I mean, who knows what was happening behind the scenes. Right. But at least cor they had everything they needed from me, and I didn't really hear anything more. I didn't see anything in the news about it. I, it just seemed to uh, go away. Uh, yeah. But you, but you still felt that you needed to, to do something about it. And so what you contacted a journalist? Well, I, I remember speaking with Barbara Anderson. Right. And I just told her the story of, mm. of you know, what, what happened when I was at Bethel. And she had reached out to an AP reporter and I think relayed that information. And uh, he contacted me and he said there was another related sort of issue this that they is, actually... Um, I'm trying to find the name now. So... It was the Associated Press. It was Chris Rowley. Chris Rowley, okay, right. yeah. And, and um, so Chris had emailed me, and, and mm. I still have that correspondence. And he said there was another matter that, that uh, they ended up getting a small fine for that involved construction waste, is, is mm. what he told me. And, uh, but he wanted to learn, well, what's this other issue? And mm. so I explained it all to him. And, and credit to him, he, um, he, he, he started asking the questions of the DEC, of, of uh, the Watchtower. And um, next thing I know, there's a, a fairly sophisticated remediation project at Watchtower Farms um, with a focus on the areas that, that I had pointed out to the investigators. Mm. Um, I drew an aerial map. You know, it's a large, it's a thousand acre facility. Mm. So it's very large. And so I, had an aerial map from Microsoft Terra server at the time. <laughs> and I pointed out, this is where this happened. This is where this happened. This is where this happened. And sure enough, it, 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 it appears that that's, they found issues there. Okay. And um, they got remediated. So when you say remediated, so the DEC had initially sort of not really done anything. Then the uh, reporter gets involved. And because of the pressure th through the press, mm -hmm. was it the DEC that uh, instigated the remedial process? You know, I, I can only speculate. Right. And, and I will say that these things don't happen in an instant. Yeah. E even if you're going to plan a, a large remediation project, there could be a lot of the things that the DEC was working on behind the scenes that I had no idea yeah. on. It's just from what I could see, I, I saw no action. So from your perspective, things had ground to a standstill, but it could have been that things were just churning away in the Possibly. background. Okay. Possibly. So when you say there was remedial action taken, this was in, was this in 2007? No, the remedia, and, and it's in that AP story where right. they talk about the Brownsfield remediation project. Yeah. I believe it spanned from 2010 and it finally terminated in 2012. The, um, the one DEC official there, Matt uh, Hubicki, I think his name is, mm -hmm. he, uh, and he, he mentioned some of the stuff that I relayed as far as what had happened initially and that the site was uh, being cleaned up. So it says uh, an investigation found that several 55 gallon drums contained chemicals, including inks and solvents that were used at Watchtower's printing press off Red Mills Road. Um, so there was an investigation, mm -hmm. which it seems your information was very yeah. helpful in. Right. And you were telling me off camera that it would have been taxpayer money that funded all of this remedial work. It, when I looked up what a Brownsfield Act remediation was mm. it, it it seemed to indicate that there there was taxpayer money involved now i i do know in that article they quote the the, the watchtower society is saying well we fully funded it mm. i don't know the funding i know the act uh does provide funding whether or not watchtower received it i can't say mm. but it's, it's possible it's okay. quite possible okay so as of now Mm -hmm. To your knowledge, the situation's been fixed. It's been fixed. I did notice in the remediation plan they have an ongoing commitment. Right. And if I understand it correctly, well, there's an area where they have to continuously monitor. Mm -hmm. um, if new construction is to occur in that area, they have to do additional testing. So there's, there's a sort of an ongoing commitment to mm -hmm. one certain area. 
my, I suspect it is the area that, that the soil was, mm. was disked into, you know, the, yeah. the waste was disked into. Um, so that's the on, only thing that's ongoing. Everything else seems to have been uh, excavated. They said they had ground penetrating radar and they, rem they found some waste, construction waste. Would they have areas. excavated the soil that you disked into the... It, I don't know. I don't, yeah. It doesn't appear to be that way. Right. Um, it's, it's, how can I say this? It's not the end of the world to, to, to do that to soil, uh, to, to, to this type of waste. Mm. Uh, if you do disperse, ah, you know, I can't say. Yeah. I can't say. Difficult uh, to it's, say. It's pure speculation. Okay. Well, no, that, but that's helpful because um, what you've shared with us is that, you know, and they seem to be mindful of this when it was being brought to their attention. What you've shared to us is evidence that this is an incredibly hypocritical organization. Right. Yes. And, you know, I remember just from my background yeah. in, in hazardous waste and nuclear power, I remember saying to my, to my overseer and, and a few others in the room that, you know, these regulatory bodies, they're not out to find people out of business or, to, to, or they're not out to get you. Mm. If you discover an issue like this and you're forthcoming and you're transparent mm. and you're, you're genuinely trying to fix it, they're going to work with you. Mm. It's only when you try to hide and, and try to, you know, deceive, really, yeah. uh, that you're going, you're going to invoke their mm. wraths. <laughs> so... It feels very much as though the organization just refuses for there to be anything discoverable about its past, even though there are things about its past, rather than, you know, own up to them and say, well, we made this mistake, now we're going to do things better. Right. The approach seems to be, we're going to pretend this never happened and right. remove all evidence of it having happened. Right. And that, and that seems to be the pattern. And, and during this time, you know, child abuse issues started coming to light. Mm. And I saw the same sort of mindset coming into play. Well, let's, mm. let's downplay it. Let's keep everyone quiet. Let's cover it over. Mm. Nothing to see here. Yeah. And I saw that mindset firsthand in this matter as well. Okay. So, so uh, gosh, <laughs> you've shared so much there. Um, and maybe at some future point, it would be nice to have you back on the channel just to share some of your experiences just normal, regular, quote yeah. unquote, normal Bethelite experiences. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but b before we conclude, I'd like to learn more about, you know, where you're up to now and how you've been able to kind of reconcile your past in this organization and how you've been able to presumably find yourself in a better place. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think the uh, sort of the worst part of the religion is that you you end up having your entire social universe mm. uh, inside of the religion. So um, your friends, your family, you know, they're all weaponized against you if you mm. decide to leave. Mm. I think I had it be better than most. Mm. I moved for my work. Mm. So I didn't have a contingent of friends that you would normally have if you stayed in one area. Mm. Uh, my family, uh, you know, I, I didn't come out unscathed when it, when it comes to that. I'm still facing, even though I've never been disfellowshipped, I'm still facing shunning now mm. that actually just sort of reemerged recently. Yeah, you were saying off camera that uh, actually only six months ago, so during mm. this pandemic. Yes. Um, your father started shunning you. That's right. He said he listened to a talk. I don't know if it was a talk at the Kingdom Hall or at an assembly mm. where they said, even if someone is living the life of someone who should be disfellowshipped, you should treat him as disfellowshipped. Mm. And so he relayed that to me in a letter that basically said, we can't talk to you anymore unless it's an emergency. Mm. And, and that's kind of how things have been left. Mm. So I didn't come out of it completely unscathed, but since leaving the organization, I, I have my own family mm. and my own friends, and I, it's no longer the weapon that it could have been, and, uh, and I really feel for people that are affected by it. You feel you've had some time to process things. Yes. And in a, in a way, there's an irony here, because 
you know, I'm revisiting a story that I that was literally one of the very first things I wrote about <laughs> as an activist ten years ago. Because we're in 2021 now. I wrote right. about it in 2011, and you know, I think I'm fairly safe in saying that one of the things that prompted you to reach out to me and feel comfortable coming on camera was this decision of your father to start shunning you because yeah. you know what do you have to lose now exactly you know? that's yeah. exactly right yeah. and you know when i reported this matter i did so anonymously so so that i wouldn't face retaliation yeah. and and possibly be disfellowshipped we know how they've disfellowshipped people for speaking up about child abuse mm. they certainly would disfellowship someone for speaking up against this yeah and um so i did that for them and for a while, it was okay. We had a somewhat normal relationship for a decade. Yeah, it's, yeah. for me, it's, it's further evidence that the kind of cruel, draconian nature mm. of the organization works against the organization. Right. Because if they'd have shown more love to you, if your father had shown more love to you, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation no. right now. No, no. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely right. But I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you for coming forward. And... Yeah. and <laughs> Because it got to the point where I was kind of mentally burying this story as, well, I can't prove this anymore because the press articles aren't clickable anymore. Right. It essentially feels like it just happened in my head. Um, but, but for you to come forward and, you know, remind me that I'm not crazy and this thing did happen right. uh, is very helpful indeed. And mm -hmm. as I understand it, you have some documentation which we can maybe include yeah. uh, in sure. the links below. So. Sure, that's right, yeah. Uh, I'll provide some of the information I presented to the yeah. investigators. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much all right. for thank coming you, all the way to Croatia and speaking to Thanks me. I know you've been me. doing other things while you've been here. Beautiful country. It really is, enjoy your country. Brilliant. So, viewers, I hope you found this conversation interesting. I have found it fascinating. Don't forget that to see more such videos, all you need to do is subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel but that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.